Standard state conditions. When the values of thermodynamic quantities are given on the test, they are almost always given for standard state conditions. A thermodynamic quantity under standard state conditions is indicated with a superscript circle, which you'll see right here. For standard state conditions, gases are going to be at 1 atm. Liquids will be pure, solids are pure, solutions are 1 molar concentration. Energy of formation of elements, such as sodium or diatomics, so F2, Br2, in its normal state are defined as zero. And temperature for standard state is 25 degrees Celsius, which is 298 Kelvin. Standard state values can be calculated for other temperatures, but when using the values that are in the back of a book or most tables, it's going to be 25 degrees Celsius. Delta S or entropy. Entropy is the measure of randomness or disorder in a system. It can be defined as the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants entropy values. Without calculating and just knowing qualitatively, liquids are going to have a higher entropy value than solids. Gases have higher entropy values than liquids, and particles that are in solutions have higher entropy values than solids. Lower pressures and higher temperatures also have higher entropy values. This is due to them having more dispersal or having more microstates. There's more possibilities of where they're at at any given moment in time. If a system has more disorder, that's a positive delta S. So let's look at this first problem. When you're given a reaction and it has different numbers of gases on both sides of the reaction, you can look just at the number of gases. We went from zero moles of gas to one mole of gas. Gases are going to be more dispersed and have more microstates, so that's going to be an increase in delta S, or entropy. This next one went from three moles of reactants total to two moles of products, but more importantly, we went from one mole of gas to no moles of gas. So that's a decrease or a negative delta S value for the reaction. Go ahead and pause the video and try C through G on your own. Restart when you're done. The next one went through from three moles of gas to no moles of gas, so that should have been a negative delta S. The next one, we went from no gas to one mole of gas, so that's a positive delta S. When a salt dissolves in water, you're basically having a solid and a liquid making aqueous. So that's going to be more disorder because we had two pure substances and now we have a mixture. For the next one, we went from one atm to two atm, so we had a increase in pressure. When pressure increases, then the particles are going to be more compact, making it have a decrease in delta S. And finally, 50 degrees or 100 degrees. At a higher temperature, the molecules will be moving faster, so there's more randomness in their motion. So that's going to be a positive delta S. I'm going to pause the video and try doing the same thing, but given these particle diagrams. So for the first one, this is a lower temp. We know that from the arrows being shorter. This one is going to be a higher temp. Higher temps have more disorder, so that's going to be a positive delta S. And then in this bottom one, we have a decrease in volume. Well, if the volume decreases, there's less places that the atoms can go, which means it must have a decrease in delta S because there's going to be less microstates because the gas is less dispersed. So on this one, we're going to predict the sign of delta S and explain and then predict the sign of delta H and explain. Remember that from unit six, delta H is enthalpy and that's the heat of reaction. So for the first one, delta S is positive. Because the process goes from a liquid to a gas, and gases are more dispersed, so the product has more microstates. So 
before this bottom one, delta H is positive because the substance is vaporizing. It's going from a liquid to a gas. And when it goes from a liquid to a gas, intermolecular forces, or IMFs, have to be broken, which requires energy, making the process endothermic. If it was going from a gas to a liquid, it would condensate, and then intermolecular forces are being formed, and that would be exothermic. So in this case, our delta H and delta S are positive. Go ahead and pause the video and calculate delta S for this reaction using the delta S values provided. So first I'm gonna do my products. So three times CO2 plus four times my water minus all of my reactants. So one C3H8 plus five oxygens. I'd recommend doing all of your products. So get this whole value and then get all of my reactant values. Make sure I don't mess up plugging it into the calculator. And so my units are gonna be the same units that are in the chart, which is joules per mole times Kelvin. Gibbs free energy, or delta G, is a measure of whether or not a process will proceed without the input of outside energy. If a reaction occurs without, if a reaction occurs without outside energy input, then it's thermodynamically favored, while one that does not is said to be unfavorable. If delta G is negative, then the reaction is thermodynamically favorable. If delta G is positive, the reaction is thermodynamically unfavored. And if delta G is zero, then the system is simply at equilibrium. Just like delta H and delta S, we can find delta G naught by doing the sum of our delta G products minus the sum of our delta G reactants by multiplying by, co by the coefficients like we've done previously. Delta G takes into account delta H and delta S into its equation. So delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. For delta S, make sure that you convert your joules to kilojoules and temperature must be in Kelvin. So then delta G will be in kilojoules. Sometimes your reaction is always going to be spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable. That occurs when delta H is negative and delta S is positive. So it doesn't matter what the temperature is, it's always gonna have a negative delta G. It's never spontaneous if delta H is positive and delta S is negative. And if the signs for H and S are the same, then it's gonna be temperature dependent. If they're both positive, it's spontaneous at high temperatures. If they're both negative, then it's spontaneous or thermo thermodynamically favorable at low temperatures. To help you remember that without drawing out that table on the left, you can also just draw a box. One side delta H, one side delta S. Positive, negative, positive, negative. For delta H, exothermic favors a thermodynamically favorable reaction because it's exothermic. It's going to release energy. While endothermic, you'd have to absorb energy before the reaction went. And for delta S, more disorder is what the universe goes towards. So when both delta S and delta H are favorable for a thermodynamically favorable reaction, then it's always spontaneous. So at all temps, delta G will be negative. When delta H is positive and delta S is negative, then it's never spontaneous. And again, if they're both positive, that's going to be high temp. And if they're both negative, then at low temps. To figure out what temperature is high and low, you would set delta G to zero, plugging in your actual delta H and delta S value 
to see what the temperature would have to be. If both my H and S are positive, then I would want a number bigger than the temperature solved for. And if they're both negative, I would choose a temperature less than T. So it could be like any number greater than 300 would be thermodynamically favorable if it was a high temp. Or I could say any temperature less than 300 would be a low temp. Going to read this problem and try it. Restart when you have your answer. So it says that the reaction is not favorable at low temps, but is favored as the temperature increases, which means it depends on temperature. So H and S must have the same sign. Because it is not favorable at low temps, but favorable as the temperature increases, H and S must both be positive. So looking at our answer choices, B is the only one that has a positive H and S. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one. Restart when you're done. So here I can see that my delta H is negative and that goes towards a thermodynamically favorable reaction. My S, I have a solid, a gas, and a solid. So I go from half of a gas to no gas. So delta S must be negative because I had a decrease in entropy. The reaction is favorable because it says that it essentially goes to completion. So I know that the answer is either A or C, but only delta H is for a thermodynamically favorable reaction. We want a positive S for it to be enthalpy and entropy. So the answer is A. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Restart when you are done. So for this one, we went from a gas to a solid. So our delta S should be negative because solids have less disorder because they have less microstates and they're less dispersed than a gas would be. My delta H, I'm going from a gas to a solid, and so I should be forming intermolecular forces between the molecules to make a solid because breaking intermolecular forces is endothermic. And it says that the reaction is occurring at 10 degrees Celsius, so my delta G must be negative as well. So the answer is D. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Restart when you're done. So in this problem, we have solid NaCl is being dissolved in water. Since it dissolves, delta G should be negative. Also, we have a solid dissolving to aqueous, so delta S should be positive. It says that the temperature goes down, which means it's endothermic, and so delta H should be positive. So C should have been the answer that you got. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Restart when you're done. So step one is you should have converted your delta S to kilojoules by dividing by 1,000. And then our temperature needed to be converted to Kelvin by adding 273. So then delta G is negative 244.04 kilojoules per mole. So this reaction, because we have a negative delta G, is thermodynamically favorable. So thermodynamically favorable tells us that the reaction should go, but what if we don't get any products? 
Kinetics is telling us how fast a reaction will proceed. Equilibrium tells us how far a reaction proceeds. And thermodynamics is going to tell us whether or not a reaction is favorable at a given temperature. Just because a reaction that is favorable, it may form products at equilibrium, but maybe it's doing, so, doing it so slowly that only a few products form in a reasonable amount of time. So we say that those reactions are under kinetic control. So if you see a problem that says your delta G is negative or you have a really large K, why are you not getting any products? The answer usually lies in the sense of kinetics. So think about kinetic reasons why the reaction may not occur. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one. Restart when you're done. As we said before, our delta G is negative, so that means we should be seeing products. But it fails to produce a significant amount of products. So the only reason why we wouldn't create any products if we had a delta G less than zero is kinetics. So it doesn't have anything to do with enthalpy or entropy. It has to do with the activation energy. If our activation energy is too small, then that means it would occur really fast. If activation energy is too large, then that means it occurs really slow. So it must be D because our reaction must be under kinetic control. We can relate delta G and K with the equation delta G equals negative rat length, which is negative R, T, L, and K. When using R in thermodynamic quantities, we wanna make sure that we use the 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. And temperature still needs to be in Kelvin. If our delta G is near zero, then K will be close to one. If delta G is much larger or much smaller than RT, then our value of K will deviate. When delta G is less than zero, then the products are favored and K will be large. So basically a negative delta G is gonna to correspond to a large K value, which corresponds to lots of products. When delta G is positive or greater than zero, the reactants are favored and K will be less than one. Go ahead and pause this video and restart when you're done. Pay close attention to the units. So our R or our delta G, one of the two needs to be converted. So I'm gonna go ahead and convert my R to kilojoules, but you could have converted your delta G to joules. It does not matter as long as one of them is converted to make sure they're in the same unit. Temperature should be 298 and LNK. I'd recommend solving for everything but LNK. So divide by our R and divide by T and we get 49.16. To get rid of LN, we do opposite of LN, which is raise it to the power of E. So K is equal to 2.24 times 10 to the 21st. So notice our delta G is negative. Our K is very large. So this is forward reaction favored. We're gonna have lots of products. So looking at either the K or the delta G tells you that the reaction is forward favored. Cell potential. Every half reaction has an electric potential or voltage associated with it. The larger or more positive a half reaction, the more likely it is to occur. So fluorine, gaining electrons to turn into fluorine ion, has a very large E potential. While lithium gaining an electron to turn into lithium metal has a very negative potential which means this one is more likely to occur and lithium ion turning into lithium metal is very unlikely to occur. A redox reaction will be thermodynamically favorable if its potential has a positive value. So if E is positive, delta G will be negative. That's explained through the relationship of delta G naught is equal to negative NFE or negative NEFI. 
Delta G is our Gibbs free energy, and that's going to be in joules per mole. Very important to recognize that that needs to be in joules. N is the number of moles of electrons that are going to be exchanged in the reaction. F is Faraday's constant. This value, 96,485 coulombs per mole, is found on your reference material. And E0 is the standard reduction potential. Voltage is what it's measured in, which is equivalent to joules per coulomb. That's why delta G needs to be in joules. So using the information above, we're going to write a balanced net ionic equation for a thermodynamically favorable reaction. When you're not given an equation and you're just given standard reduction potentials, you're going to look and see which one is more positive. The more positive one is going to be more likely to occur, so it's going to stay written as it is. The more negative is going to be reversed or oxidized. So we're going to reverse the bottom one, and the other thing you need to look at is your electrons. Notice that the electrons do not cancel out. Sometimes you have to multiply one reaction, sometimes you're going to multiply both reactions, and sometimes you don't have to multiply either reaction. But in this case, I need to multiply the top reaction by 3 and the bottom reaction by 2, so my electrons will cancel out. I like to put my electrons on the end, or you can leave off your electrons altogether, but your electrons can't be in your final reaction. So I have 6 electrons plus 3 chlorine plus 2 Fe. Notice I'm reversing this bottom reaction, and that goes to 3 chlorine ions plus two iron free ions plus six electrons. Notice my electrons cancel out. If they didn't cancel out, something's wrong with my equation. So this is my balanced net ionic equation. Remember that the electrons have to be removed for it to be a net ionic equation. So for my E cell, I do 1.36 volts plus 0.04 volts. When I reverse my equation, my sign of E0 is going to change. When I multiply a reaction, E cell remains the same. So although I multiplied my reactions, I did not multiply my E cells or my E naughts. So adding those together, I get 1.40 volts. For the last one, I'm looking for delta G. So delta G equals negative Nephi. I'm looking for delta G. My N is number of electrons. That's how many I canceled out. So minus 6. F was Faraday's constant. And E was what I just calculated. Multiplying that out, I get negative 8.10 times 10 to the fifth joules. In galvanic cells, also referred to as voltaic cells, an electric current is generated by keeping the two half reactions separated to produce a current from the flow of electrons through a wire. Oxidation is going to occur at the anode, and reduction occurs at the cathode. You do need to remember that. You can either say an ox and red cat to help you remember, or I always say the vowels go together and the consonants go together. So anode and oxidation, reduction and cathode. Electrons are always going to flow from anode to cathode. So to help you remember that, that's fat cat. From anode to cathode. So go ahead and pause the video, figure out which reaction is going to stay as written and which one is going to get reversed. Then figure out which reactions occurring at the anode, the cathode, the overall equation, and our E cell. Restart when you have those done. So this one should be reversed because it's less positive. So if it's being reversed, oxidation is occurring. This one stays as written, so it is reduction. Anode is where oxidation occurs, but for oxidation, this top reaction should be reversed, so 
the reaction occurring at the anode should be the reversed reaction. Make sure that you reverse it. A common mistake is not reversing that reaction. The cathode is where reduction occurs. And so that one is going to be just as it is above. I don't need to multiply my reactions yet. I do for the overall reaction. So for my overall reaction, I should be multiplying my silver by two so my electrons will cancel out. So adding that all together, you should have gotten one copper metal plus two silver ions. Make two silver metal and a copper plus two ion. For my E cell, I'm going to have 0.80 minus 0.34, since I reversed that top one, giving me 0.46 volts. Make sure that you show that addition to make sure that you're getting full credit since all work needs to be shown. Let's see what this cell looks like in action. So on our left beaker, we're gonna go in and put our copper solution. And then on the right, we're gonna go ahead and put our silver solution. Notice that our metals are our electrodes and they're connected with a wire over here to our voltmeter. We calculated that we would get 0.46 volts. So notice we got a negative voltage, which means we have it connected opposite. So if we reconnect with our silver on the left and our copper on the right, now we have our positive 0.46 voltage. So our copper electrode, we said, is going to be losing mass because it's going from copper metal to copper ion. Here we can see that taking place. It loses two electrons and it turns into a copper ion, which goes into solution. Our electrons go up through the wire over here to the silver side. As those electrons come down, then the silver ions are attracted to the electrode and then played out as silver metal. When it turns into silver metal, those ions get bigger in size because atoms are going to be bigger than the positive ions that make it up. And over here, copper ions are formed and they're going to be smaller than the copper atoms. So go ahead and pause the video and try this part of a problem from the 2019 test. Restart when you're done. So for this one, it says write a balanced equation for the reaction that's thermodynamically favorable that produces bromine. Well, bromine is right here in this top reaction. And if I want to produce bromine, this reaction must be reversed. So it's going to be oxidized. In order for it to be thermodynamically favorable, my E cell needs to be positive overall. And since this one's being reversed, one of these two is going to be, needs to stay as written. The only way that I can get a positive E cell when saying X plus negative 1.07 to give me a positive number is if I use this second half reaction. Notice that my chlorine or my electrons will cancel out. So your balanced equation should have reversed that top reaction and kept the second reaction as it is. So that is your balanced equation that's thermodynamically favorable that produces bromine. On the 2019 test, you got one point if you wrote that as your answer. But then it also says justify that the reaction is thermodynamically favorable by calculating the E. Well, my E cell would be 1.36 plus negative 1.07, which gives me a 0.29 volts. Since E cell is positive, the reaction is thermodynamically favorable. Go ahead and pause the video and try these three from the 20, 2008 exam. Restart when you were done. So for this one, they gave you the reaction. 
and they gave you the overall E cell. So we know that it's 0 0.2, 0 0.62 volts is equal to, notice that copper is on the left. Over here, copper's on the right. So that top one was reversed, so it's negative 0.34 plus X gives me 0.62. So X has to equal 0.96 volts. So you got one point for that answer. Then for part B, we're calculating delta G. So delta G equals negative NFE. Our number of electrons, we notice we got two and we have a three, so that means our electrons should have been six. You got one point for putting six as your number of electrons. F was 96,485, and our E, be very careful, we don't want the 0.96 because 0.96 is just a half reaction. We want what they gave us, which was just 0.62 volts. So our delta G is negative 3.6 times 10 to the fifth joules. And although I put it in scientific notation, you didn't have to put it in scientific notation, nor the other one that I put in scientific notation on a previous problem. So then you got another point if you got that as your joules. Notice that our delta G is negative because we have a positive E cell. So finally, part C says justify or predict whether the value of delta S is going to be greater than zero, less than zero, or equal to zero, and justify your prediction. So for that problem, you should have said that delta S is greater than zero, in other words, it's positive, because the reaction goes from zero moles of gas, notice that we don't have any gas, to two moles of gas. As gases are more dispersed, gases have more microstates, so delta S is positive. Go ahead and pause the video and figure out these questions. Restart when you're done with them. So the first thing you should have done is looked at your two half reactions and figured out which one would be reversed. This one is less positive, so we need to reverse the top one. And the bottom one is my reduction. So E cell should equal negative 0.44 plus 2.36. So that's 1.92 volts. The next thing I would do is label everything in my picture. Even before seeing what the questions are, sometimes it's helpful if you have everything labeled in your picture. So again, this one was reversed. This is where oxidation is occurring. This one is my reduction. So if iron is being reduced, reduction occurs at the cathode. Magnesium is reversed. Oxidation is occurring there, so that's my anode. Electrons always flow from anode to cathode. Sometimes you have to draw the electron flow. So remember, electrons do not flow through the salt bridge. Electrons do not just randomly go through the solution. They're going to go through the metal, up the wire, to the other side. So metals conduct the current, and that's why the reaction only occurs on the surface of the electrode. Another thing that would be helpful to go ahead and diagram is looking at that reaction, I have iron ion going to iron metal, so it should be going that way. In my magnesium, if I reverse the reaction, it's a little bit easier to see that I should be going from magnesium metal to magnesium ion. So I've drawn my arrows already, I've labeled my anode, I've labeled my cathode, Towards which electrode will the potassium ion flow in the salt bridge? So the whole purpose of a salt bridge is to neutralize the charges. If we notice in the picture, 
we're producing magnesium ions and I'm losing positive ions in the cathode. I can't have a charge buildup of all these positive ions because the electrons are going to stop moving from the anode to the cathode when I have a charge buildup. So the salt bridge is there to neutralize that charge. The positive ion is going to go towards the cathode. So cations go towards the cathode. They're going to the cathode to replace those positive ions that are turning into neutral oxidation numbers for iron. And then the nitrate is going to go towards the anode. So anions go towards the anode because that negative charge needs to cancel out with that positive charge. And the final question says, what will happen to the mass of the magnesium electrode? Well, if we look at it, the magnesium electrode is turning into magnesium ion. So magnesium should be going down in mass. While if we look at the iron electrode, the iron ions are plating onto the iron electrode, so this mass will go up. So the mass will increase on this side and the mass will decrease on this side. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Restart when you're done. This one's a throwback to a few minutes ago when we were talking about why a reaction would occur even though the delta G was negative. So here it says that we have positive potentials. It is thermodynamically favorable. Why is it that lithium occurs more slowly? So when it's talking about rates, when we're talking rates, it has something to do with kinetics. So it doesn't have anything to do with C or D. A and B both talk about something to do with kinetics. A says that it's favorable, but it's kinetically slow. So A is saying that it's thermodynamically favorable, but it's kinetically slow. That sounds pretty good. And then B says the reaction of lithium with water requires a catalyst. It may have a higher activation energy, but it's not going to require a catalyst. Um, whereas the reactions with sodium and potassium do not. So nowhere does this information say that I have to have a catalyst. It's just saying that it's going slowly. We don't know why it's going slowly, but kinetically it's slower. So that's why A is our best answer. Sometimes you need a couple of reaction to get the amount of desired product that you want. Two reactions are said to be coupled when the product of one of them is the reactant in the next reaction. This is helpful if let's say the first reaction has a delta G that's positive. It wouldn't normally go or at least not have a very good drive to have very many products. But if my second reaction has a delta G that's negative, as a product is being formed in B, it would be getting used up in the next reaction, which would help drive the reaction forward for the delta G positive reaction. So the removal of substance B by the second reaction causes equilibrium of the first to shift to the right which drives the second reaction and the first reaction. We can also see it here where we have A plus B yields C plus D. We have a common intermediate of D, so as D is formed in reaction one, it's getting used up in the second reaction, which is gonna keep this first reaction going to the right, producing products, because as soon as that product's formed, it's being used up in the second reaction. And equilibrium constant of our overall reaction is going to be the product of our two equilibrium constants of the previous reactions. So this one's K1, this one's K2. So our overall reaction of A plus B plus E yields C plus F is K1 times K2. When we couple reactions, or half reactions, we may have to multiply by a factor or reverse the reactions before we can couple them and add them together. So we see this with equilibrium constants. We can see it with free energy, so delta G, delta H, or delta S. 
Then we can also see it with E cell. So with delta H, we refer to that one as Hess's law. When we multiply a reaction, we're going to raise our K to whatever the power was. For delta H, S and G, we just multiply by that factor. And remember for standard reduction, if we multiply the reaction, we don't do anything to the E cell. If you flip a reverse reaction, we would do inverse of K, so 1 over K when we reverse the reaction. For H, S, or G, we're just going to change the sign, as well as for E, we change the sign. And when we add the reactions, for K, we multiply the values like I showed you on the previous slide. For H, S, and G, we just add the values, and for E, we add the values. So that's the differences when we add reactions for coupling for our K, H, S, G, and E values. When a reaction is not standard, remember that we said that standard conditions is one molarity or one ATM. When our cell is at standard conditions, Q will be one. And as the cell operates, Q gets bigger and voltage approaches zero as equilibrium is established. So we have reactants, we have products. As the cell operates, we're getting more and more products. So if our products are in Q, Increasing, Q is getting bigger and bigger. If Q is greater than 1, then it's closer to K and closer to equilibrium and closer to zero voltage, so the voltage is less than standard. If Q is less than 1, then the voltage will be greater as it tries to achieve equilibrium. And if E cell is zero, then Q is equal to K and the cell is already at equilibrium. So let's see what that means in practice. So on this problem, it says that we increased cerium plus four. Well, our Q is copper two plus, cerium three plus squared over cerium four plus squared. This one is one molarity, this one's one molarity, and this is some number greater than one molarity. We'll just go with two molarity. So basically, we have 1 times 1 squared, so 1 over 2 squared, 4. Notice that our Q is now less than 1 because we increased the amount of reactant. So when Q is less than 1, E cell will increase. As cerium increases, our Q will decrease to less than 1 as the reaction is further from equilibrium. I would write my Q expression. You don't have to write the exact numbers because, again, we don't know numbers, but you can say as cerium increases, then Q will decrease. And it's decreasing less than 1. So go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Restart when you're done. So our Q was the same, so this time we've increased a product. So since Q is equal to my products over my reactants, increasing a product will mean my Q will become greater than 1. So E cells should decrease. As copper ions increase, Q will increase to more than 1, as the reaction is closer to equilibrium and closer to a zero voltage. And go ahead and pause the video and try this last one on your own. Restart when you're done. So for this one, we doubled the mass of copper. But recall, when we wrote the Q expression, we didn't include this one because it's a solid. So if I double the mass of a solid or decrease the mass of a solid, then Q would remain the same. And if Q remains the same, then E cell will remain the same. All right, finally, we have electrolytic cells. In an electrolytic cell, E cell is negative and delta G is positive. 
so the reaction is thermodynamically unfavorable. In order for the reaction to occur, an outside source of voltage must be applied. Sometimes the current will be passed through a molten compound or pure water, and only one possible set of products can be produced. But most of the time, it's going to be passed through either an aqueous solution, or you'll have a mixture of substances to choose from. So if it's an aqueous solution, you have to determine the products of the reactant by comparing the E values. So the problem says what products will form at the anode and cathode when electricity passes through nickel 2 chloride and what is the overall net ionic equation in E cell? So the first thing that you need to do is look at the half reactions to determine which ones are your oxidation and which ones are your reduction? Well, if I have nickel chloride, then I have nickel ions and I have chloride ions, which means this bottom reaction has to be reversed. And it's an aqueous solution, which means I have water. So I have water there and water here. So that means that this reaction also has to be reversed. Since the top and bottom are reversed, those are my two possible reactions that are oxidation. Those are my two possibilities for what's occurring at the anode. So this one on the right, I've reversed those two reactions so we can see that I have my chloride and nickel ions and I've got water on the left hand side. So of the top and the bottom, I need to choose the one that's more positive. Well, water is more positive. It's at a negative 1.23 volts. So that means my anode reaction is that top reaction. So I'm going to be producing oxygen gas at the anode. not chlorine gas. And then at the cathode, it's got to be one of those middle two reactions. Of those two, my nickel is more positive or less negative, however you want to think about it. So at the cathode, I'm going to have nickel being plated. I do need to multiply this cathode reaction by two for my overall reaction. So my electrons will cancel out. So I have two waters plus two nickel ions yields oxygen gas, hydrogen ions, and nickel metal. My overall E cell, I used this top reaction. So negative 1.23 and I've already reversed the sign of that, plus negative 0.25. So I get negative 1.48 volts. Notice that my E cell is negative, which is to be expected because I'm having to pass electricity through it. So it is thermodynamically unfavorable. So go ahead and try this one from the 2005 AP test. Restart when you're done. So this problem is very similar to the one we saw a second ago. We're going to have sodium iodide breaking up into sodium and iodine ions. So I need sodium ion and iodine ions on the same side. So I'm going to go ahead and reverse this one so I can see it better. And when I do that, that's going to turn into negative 0.53. And then my other ones, I need my two waters on the same side. So that one's already on the same side. And this one, again, I need to reverse. And so that's going to make it negative 1.23.
So these top two are reversed, which means those are oxidation. And oxidation occurs at the anode. Doesn't matter if it's electrolytic or galvanic, oxidation occurs at the anode. So if I want my balanced oxidation, I look at these two and the iodine is more positive. So the half reaction taking place is going to be that one. So that's my answer to I. You got one point for that answer. Then my balanced reduction half reaction, I'm gonna look at these bottom two. Those are my reduction, those are occurring at the cathode. Of those two, the water is more positive. So that's the reaction taking place at the cathode. So you got one point for that answer. Then three says which reaction takes place at the anode? The oxidation, reduc oxidation reaction or reduction? Well, we've already answered that up above. We said that the anode is always where oxidation occurs. So at the anode should be oxidation reaction. So you got one point for saying oxidation reaction. And then finally, all electrolysis reactions have the same sign for delta G. Is it positive or negative? And then justify your answer. For that last one, you should have said that the sign for delta G for all electrolysis reactions is positive because electrolysis reactions are non-spontaneous or not thermodynamically favorable. Energy in the form of applied electrical energy or electrical work must be applied to make the reaction occur. So for this answer, you needed to say that it was positive and then that it's not thermodynamically favorable, so energy will need to be applied. You also could have referenced that delta G has to be positive because delta G equals negative NFE. N is a positive value, F is a positive value, and my E will always be negative. So negative times negative means delta G has to be positive. Many electrolytic problems are simply just really long stoic problems. Before we get to an example, you need to know some definitions. An amp or amperes is a measure of current, and those are measured in coulombs per second. Faraday is 96,485 coulombs per mole of electrons. So we saw that with our delta G calculations, but now we need to make sure that we're paying very close attention to our, to our units. So Q is our charge, and that's gonna be in coulombs. And then T is time in seconds. So again, amps, or I, is coulombs per second. This equation is on the formula chart. So here's one example of a stoic problem that you could see that's an electrolytic problem. The very first step I would do is rewrite this 3.8 amps. It stands for 3.80 coulombs per second. That's a conversion factor, which means I'm not going to start with it. You're going to start with time or amount. In this case, we're going to start with time. So I have 25 minutes, and you probably want to be writing small or far to the left. I'm trying to use this conversion factor, so I have to get minutes to seconds. So one minute is equal to 60 seconds. Once I get it to seconds, I can convert my seconds to coulombs. Up above, I have one second for 3.80 coulombs. Faraday's constant says that you have 96,485 coulombs for every one mole of electrons. My mole of electrons, I can convert to moles of iron. For every one mole of iron, I'm gonna have three moles of electrons, and that's because it's iron plus three. If it was iron plus two, I would have two moles of electrons. 
If it was iron plus one, I'd have one mole of electrons. And finally, one mole of iron I can find from the periodic table is 55.85 grams. So multiplying and dividing, I get 1.1 grams of iron. Go ahead and pause the video and try this one on your own. Uh, the only difference on this one is we're going to start with grams and we're going to go to minutes. So opposite of what we just did, but same process. So remember, I would write out 1.87 coulombs per second. You have 1.4 grams of nickel. And there's 58.69 grams of nickel for every one mole of nickel. One mole of nickel, in this case, is going to have a plus two charge. So that's two moles of electrons. We have moles of electrons for coulombs. For every one mole of electrons, that's 96,485 coulombs. We finally got to coulombs, so I can go coulombs to seconds. 1.87 coulombs for every one second. And then 60 seconds for every one minute. Multiplying and dividing, you should have got in 41 minutes. You do see these problems in the multiple choice. Sometimes they just have a setup and say which of these is set up correctly. So I would solve it out and then look at the multiple choice answers to see which ones they have on top, which numbers they have on bottom. But if you have to solve it out without a calculator, make sure you're just reducing things down and rounding. So I would say that I can say that this is 60. And so... 2 divided by 60, that's 1 and 30. And then I could divide 30, or let's just divide by 10. So then I've got 3 of these, and I can divide this by 10. So basically just take off a 0 and round it a little bit. And then I could say, well, 3 goes into this. That's 3, 2, and then we can make that a 6, so 2, 0. And then this is basically a 2, so we can say that's 1, and then divide this by 2 again. So 32 would be 1. And then divide by 10 again, so 6. And 6, get that. Divide by 2 again. That's basically a 1. That's base. This is almost 1.5. So if I said that was 1.5 and that's a 3, then this becomes a 1 and that becomes a 2. So then I could say that's 2 and that's 80. So 80 divided by 2 is 40. And we have 40 as our answer, roughly. So again, you can just keep reducing top and bottom. You could have divided by bigger numbers if you saw bigger numbers, but just keep going until it becomes manageable numbers that you can solve out. You don't want to be off to the side saying, okay, 1.4 times 2, and then let me multiply that by 96.45. You don't have time to multiply it all out. So reduce, reduce, reduce until you get manageable numbers. All right, so this last one, it says a current is passed through a solution of copper 2 chloride. What is the current used? So remember from our formula chart, current is equal to charge over time, which is really just coulombs per second. So we need to convert our mass to coulombs and we need to convert our hours to seconds. So go ahead and pause the video, solve those, and then restart when you're done to see if you're right. Okay, so you should have had converted your grams of copper to moles of copper. Be careful, in this case that was 5.3 grams of copper, but if they gave you the mass of copper chloride, you would have needed to convert 
the mass of copper chloride to moles of copper chloride.